Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in today's video we're going to be talking about Stellar Evolution using Universe Sandbox. Specifically we're going to be talking about various types of stars and how they evolve and what they'll actually end up with with time. So welcome to What The Math and hopefully you learned something new. Anyway, this star is about to go supernova, and you might actually get to see the actual explosion in a few seconds, but this is one of the simulations that has been added a while ago to Universe Sandbox, and here we have this very, very bright blue, um, blue white star, and there, there was that very brief moment where the supernova occurred, but it's all gone now. Um, and Basically, the reason I wanted to start with this is because this is actually how many, many, many stars were like back in the days, billions and billions of years ago. Most of them were very, very massive blue supergiants. Uh, there's actually another simulation here, under grids, and this is the one I want to actually take a look at. It's called stars. This kind of gives you an idea of various types of stars that do exist out there, specifically starting with things like uh, brown dwarfs, the almost stars, to uh, more sun-like stars, and unfortunately it doesn't have anything larger than that, but we're actually going to take a look at those as well. But here, if you actually accelerate time, and I, let, me, let me actually just do that in a different simulation called Big Stars, because this one, this one does have anything from star-like to uh, blue giant-like stars. So if here, if I run the simulation really fast, You'll notice that many of these stars will actually start changing. There we go, they change quite dramatically. Uh, specifically, the blue uh, giants changed really, really quickly and turned into this very bright blob right here. I don't actually know what's happening anymore because I think my game just suddenly froze or something. I don't know. There's something going on in there. Um, but anyway, the reason why we want, we, are, we want to do this in a great fashion it's because I actually wanted to take a look at uh, the major types of stars and how they actually evolve with time. So we're going to start with the blue supergiants. And for this simulation, we're going to completely disable gravity because we don't want things colliding into each other just yet. And here, what we're going to do is, well, let's just place some kind of a relatively large blue uh, white supergiant, such as, for example, Rigel. We're going to place it right here in the middle. So there's Rigel. It's going to be a pretty good example of a typical blue um, supergiant. Then we're, right next to it, we're going to place maybe a slightly smaller supergiant, because sometimes these actually behave slightly differently. So like, for example, Spica would be a pretty good example to place right next to Rigel. It's a slightly smaller star. Then we're going to place a sun-like star, and for this purpose, let's just maybe choose Pollux. It's a slightly more massive sun, uh, star than the sun. And uh, just for fun, let's also place our own sun as well, right next to it. Right here. So there is our sun. And uh, now we're going to place a few smaller stars, such as, for example, um, a red dwarf. So maybe Proxima Centauri, because that's the closest one to us. And um, we're also going to place... A brown dwarf um, by the name of Loman 16, which is actually the closest brown dwarf to our solar system, just under 7 light years away from us, and it's about 42 masses of Jupiter in mass. So, there's our typical stars in basically pretty much any galaxy, and if we were to look at the chart, this is what they would look like. So, we have relatively large and massive um, blue supergiant, specifically uh, blue-white supergiant here. We have a slightly smaller blue supergiant, which actually, this should be a little bit bigger, I think. Then we have a sun-like object, Spica, which is already entering its um, red giant stage, so it's, maybe it's not the best example here. So maybe actually we'll remove Spica, because I don't think it's a good representation. We have the sun, which is a very typical representation of these uh, medium-sized si stars. There's uh, a few of them, there's about 2% of them in total in our galaxy. And then we have a brown dwarf, Loman 16, we have a red dwarf Proxima Centauri, and that's pretty much kind of what I wanted to start with. So, 
What we know about star evolution is that for the most part, they all start with the same thing. They all start with the protostar, basically um, a, a kind of a disk with the center a lot more massive than the rest of the uh, disk. And eventually a reaction, a nuclear reaction starts on the inside and that's how the stars are formed. Now, all of these start the same, but depending on uh, the mass, obviously, they will end up as different stars. So the larger the more and more massive the star is, the less life it has in it. So this one here will actually die in, the, in only a few million years, whereas things like Proxima Centauri will live for trillions of years. Our sun is somewhere in the middle with about 10 billion uh, years of life. Uh, brown dwarfs actually don't change at all, so brown dwarfs will probably stay the same. And I think our brown dwarf just lost a bunch of material that's fine out because it's a little bit close to these stars. But for the most part, this is actually where it gets a little bit different. So, brown dwarfs, they kind of stay as brown dwarfs. So, Loman 16, in the next few trillion years, will, unless it gets swallowed by something, will probably remain in the way it is today. So, it's probably never going to change. So its sterile evolution is pretty simple. For that, for that matter, we can actually totally ignore it from now on. A red dwarf, such as Proxima Centauri, as soon as it becomes a star, it actually kind of stays this way for many, many, many trillions of years. Not, not billions, trillions of years. And eventually, it's actually going to convert into a white dwarf. So at some point, this will become and we're talking about like trillions of years here, it's, it's going to become a white dwarf. So let's see if it actually works. No, it doesn't. But it will become very similar to a star like Sirius B. So in other words, it's going to become this really, really tiny object that you can't even see because it's so small. Uh, but if I were to place it still right here, there is that white dwarf that Proxima Centauri will become one day. And it's not going to expand uh, at all. It's actually going to just kind of shrink a little bit and turn into Series B, unlike our own sun. Uh, so this, there's no red giant stage here. It's just going to become this. And then after a few more trillion years, it's actually going to change again and turn into a black dwarf. So with basically time, all uh, red dwarfs will become black dwarfs. So that's kind of how it's going to end, including, of course, our sun. Our sun is headed that, that way too, but slightly different pathway. So let's take a look at our sun. So the way it will be for our sun, unlike red dwarfs, and so most of these objects that are similar to our sun in terms of mass, will actually first um, kind of inflate quite dramatically. So we can actually simulate this here by changing the age of our sun just a little bit. Let's let's say 8 billion years. And you'll see that it kind of grew in size just a little bit. And as we increase the age even more, it's going to grow bigger and bigger in size. Now, at some point, it's going to become so big that it's going to envelop um, everything up to possibly even Earth. This will happen in something like 5 billion years from now. And then that outer shell will actually... Um, disappear. It's basically going to throw it out into um, outer solar system. And what's going to be left behind, once again, is a tiny, tiny white dwarf. So this will be the core that's going to be left behind. And then that will also become a black dwarf once again. So this will be the future of our sun. Uh, and for, for the most part, many stars like our sun will kind of go through this in the next few billion years. But one major difference between our sun and uh, red dwarfs like Proxima Centauri is that our sun will actually leave behind what's known as a planetary nebula. And there's actually quite a few of them around in our galaxy already. And so because of this shell that's going to be thrown out, which we can maybe simulate by basically just doing this. So there's your planetary nebula. Uh, this is supernova, but this is the best way we can simulate this. So this right here will kind of be out there in um, in the vicinity of our, our sun and what's, what will be left behind is of course that one tiny core, the white dwarf. But anyway, sun is gone now, so let's talk about the uh, blue supergiants. So I added two here for a reason. With smaller blue supergiants, they will usually 
uh, have two possible stages here. So depending on the mass and depending on a few other conditions, it's very likely that uh, this will also become a red giant, just like our sun. So right now I actually tried to create a red giant, but it didn't work. It actually went supernova. And this is one of the potential ways it can end. So for a lot of these smaller um, blue supergiants, what may end up happening to them is that they might actually just go supernova and then end up as a black hole at the end. So they'll actually end either as a black hole or as a neutron star, which is what happened to Spica right now. That's situation number one. Uh, so depending on the mass, they might either become a neutron star or potentially a black hole. Now, the other situation is with the spike becoming uh, very, very similar to a star like uh, Betelgeuse, which I'm trying to find here. So there we go. It might actually turn into a very, very large red giant similar to Betelgeuse. So if it's mass, it is a certain amount. It might become this first and then go supernova. And from that, from that, it might create a neutron star. However, sometimes these can also return back to a blue giant stage or even become what's known as, as a wolf red stars, which are kind of unstable blue giants that might end up going supernova as well. So when it comes to uh, smaller blue super giants, they usually have several pathways. So they can either go supernova right away or they can turn into a red giant and then go supernova. And usually, for the most part, they will normally end up as a black hole or a neutron star, which we'll see in a second as soon as this stops exploding. So uh, that's basically the smaller uh, blue supergiants. The bigger ones, however, can actually also uh, do several things. One of those things, let me just actually remove this because we don't really need this anymore. One of those things is very, very interesting. One of those things is that a, a much larger star, so in this case, we're talking about Rigel or even something bigger, like for example, stars like R136A1, which I should have placed here as well. This is a star in the nearby galaxy of large Magellanic Cloud and a supermassive star, the most massive star we've ever discovered. So these stars can actually, without any supernova, just go directly into the black hole stage. So in other words, they can turn black hole right away. I don't know if it worked, but let's see if it did. I think it actually didn't because I accidentally turned it into a planet. Not exactly what I was hoping for. Let's try this again. Let's, let's turn it into a black hole. And so let's try it again with the gravity enabled this time. And there we go. There is that Rigel black hole that just turned into a black hole without any supernova. So this is one of the possibilities with much, much larger uh, blue supergiants. And the last possibility is that sometimes, and for this we're actually going to use r 136 a uh, sometimes these stars um, just explode. And this is what usually happens. And this is what normally ends up creating these so-called stellar nurseries that then create more stars. So for the most part, many of these stars, as they live out their life, so let's maybe make this 5 million years old, will actually just go supernova and create a tremendous amount of new materials, materials that didn't exist before, specifically heavier elements. And many of these elements will then create new stars, create stellar nurseries, and eventually create stars and planets similar to our own Earth. And so that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the story of major types of stars and their evolution and what will actually happen to them throughout the years. So we've talked about the brown dwarfs, we've talked about the red dwarfs, the sun-like stars, and the uh, blue supergiants. So there's really four or maybe just maximum five types of evolutions that usually occur in our universe. And so now you might have learned something more about the star evolutions and we'll talk more about this concept in some of the future videos as well. And anyway, thank you for watching. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Share this video with someone who enjoys watching these videos. And don't forget to subscribe if you still haven't. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Space out and as always, bye bye.